Well, good morning. Happy spring. Uh, first weekend of spring this uh, year. My family and I were determined to be outside as much as possible, even though it was a little cold. We did our, our annual burning of the grasses. So all of our ornamental grasses that are now brown or have been chopped down and burnt and, and made, it, made, made for a nice warm day in doing that. But, um, but we're glad you're here. Uh, hopefully you all have a bulletin. If not, you're going to need one. So if you don't have a bulletin or if you can't reach one near you, can you raise your hand and the ushers are going to uh, make one available to you. Um, so there's something in addition to you being able to take notes that uh, we're going to do a, a responsive reading that is on the back of it. So, and I'm not going to put it up on the screen, so you're going to need the bulletin and, and need the notes for that. But as you probably noticed as you walked into the building today and entered uh, the, the fellowship hall, that we're, we're decorated for the Easter season. We're decorated for Palm Sunday. So thank you, Rosie and Rana and others who were part of that for doing that. Um, today, as mentioned, is, is Palm Sunday which is the beginning of Holy Week, which in our Baptist tradition, we don't necessarily think of it as such, but it is the beginning of Holy Week, which in the Bible is the last week of the life of Jesus, uh, starting with the triumphal entry today, Palm Sunday, and culminating in uh, Jesus' death on the cross, his burial in a borrowed tomb, and then his resurrection, which is this is why we are here. This is why we exist as believers. It's, it is this week, and especially the death, burial, and resurrection of what makes being a believer the essential truth, or it is the essential truth of being a believer. So um, for many of us, Palm Sunday and the, the story of the triumphal entry is, is a familiar story. Uh, and sometimes that familiarity uh, makes it hard for us to think that we, we can get anything out of hearing that story again, uh, as if somehow God can't use something that we've heard a hundred times uh, to teach us something new. Um, so I'm hoping that we can learn something today. That's my prayer. And there's a few things that I would like to do today uh, to try and make that happen. One is I want to try and put us in the story just a little bit. Try and, and make what was happening that day a little bit more real for us. Uh, second, um, I want to make a little bit of a connection between Palm Sunday and what we've been learning in our series in the book of Samuel, or the books of Samuel. And then the last thing, I, just, I want us to walk away from this place more in love with Jesus. And the reason we come, the reason we worship, the reason we sing, as we've been talking about in our Habits of Grace class, it's not to make us better believers. It's, it's not so that we can become more mature in the faith. It's not so that we can say that we've done all these things. But the reason is so that we can know Jesus more, to get God. Um, and so if we walk away just a little bit more in love with Jesus, then I think it was a worthy Sunday. So um, pray with me one more time um, before we get started. Father, what a glorious day you've given us not only because of the sunshine and, and, and the people that we get to be with uh, in this church service, but it's a glorious day because of the truth of who you are and what you have done on our behalf. And we're thankful for that. And we're thankful that we get to hear your voice through your word. And we're thankful that we get to interact with you as we take your word and we meditate on it and we, and we talk about it and we 
make it a part of our lives. And so, God, will you do that for us today? Will you teach us? Will you make us more like your son? And will you help us to fall in love with you just a little bit more and recognize you for who you are? And God, as is my prayer, may your words, may my words be your words. And those things that are are frivolous or insignificant, may they be quickly forgotten so that your truth can grab a hold of our hearts. So we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, as we start, I'd like us to put on our imagination caps. Actually, is that a real thing? I know in school we talk about our thinking caps, but is our imagination caps, is that a real thing? Anyway, I'm going to say it is. So what I'd like you to do is, for a moment, put on your imagination caps. And so what I'd like you to do is imagine for a moment that our entire county, so Green County, makes a pilgrimage to the city of Xenia once a year for a week-long celebration. And then let's say, let's, let's say this is a real pilgrimage. So it's not like we're all driving here from our different parts of the city or different parts of the county, but that we are actually walking on a pilgrimage all to Shawnee Park, okay? And let's say we do it around the 4th of July so that we're celebrating our nation's birthday, okay? It shouldn't be too hard to think about everybody coming to Shawnee Park to celebrate. What do you think we might be doing Use your imagination. Think what we might be doing during this little pilgrimage. Okay, besides complaining about having to take a long walk in the middle of July, okay? So what else could we be doing on this pilgrimage? Well, we might set off fireworks as we go, right? You know, things we do for our 4th of July. We might tell stories about the American Revolution, you know, the Boston Tea Party, the shot heard around the world, Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. We might quote some of the famous founding fathers and patriots from uh, the American Revolution. Uh, Like this quote from Ben Franklin, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly we will all hang separately, right? Um, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Or, you know, we might sing some of our national songs, you know, our national anthem. Not everybody will hit all the notes, but, you know, we might sing it. We'll sing America the Beautiful. We'll sing God Bless the USA by Lee Greenwood. You know, these are, these are things that we would do if we were all walking, coming together for something at Shawnee Park. And as we go along our way, we'll come across other people, and they'll join in with the things that we're doing. They'll tell stories of their own. They'll start singing the songs with us. And they will add to the excitement of our journey, right? Can you imagine that happening? Well, this is somewhat the scene of what we call Palm Sunday. The people were making their way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And if you remember... When the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt, the last of the the plagues was when the angel passed over those houses that had the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the doorposts. And those who didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the punishment was that the firstborn son in the family would die. And this... Passover is what led the Pharaoh to eventually let the people go and them to go into freedom after their enslavement in Egypt. And from that time on, Passover was celebrated every year. Just like we celebrate the 4th of July every year, Passover was a big deal and still is a big deal um, for the Jewish faith. And songs or psalms were written about it, and they were sung as a part of the celebration. 
Psalms 113 through 118, those six psalms were known as the Hallel Psalms. Hallel as in hallelujah. They were the praise songs. They were praising the Lord. And when the celebration was in Jerusalem, the people would sing these songs as a part of their pilgrimage. So what I'd like us to do, and again, is to kind of pretend that we're on our way to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know the tune. We, you know, and if we all tried to sing it right now, we'd probably all sing a different tune. And so we're not going to do it that way. But what we can do and get a sense of what it might be like to do it is to do a responsive reading out of one of these psalms. So uh, pull out your notes. And then turn it over to the back, and let's do this responsive reading together. Uh, it's adapted from Psalm 118. It's one of those Hallel psalms that was sung as a part of the Passover celebration. Um, so most of it is taken directly out of that chapter. Uh, those things that are in brackets there are things that I've added for it, but everything else... Um, is taken directly out of it in, in that order. And, and, and this isn't the entire chapter, um, but it is one of those things that, that the people would do together as they were thinking and preparing and celebrating this, and even as they're a part of this pilgrimage. So stand with me. I'm going to read the plain text, and then I'd like you to respond uh, with the text that's in the bold font. Now remember, this is a joyous celebration, so you know, we're not going to do a, a responsive reading with you know, humdrum kind of stuff, right? So know what it is that we're reading, and let's say, say it accordingly. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, Let the house of Aaron say, Let those who fear the Lord say, Love. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my defense. Amen. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Open for me the gates of the righteous. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Thanks. You may be seated. That was really good. Um, as I said, this is one of the, the a, a bit of the context for the Palm Sunday story as Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And it's, a, it's an important story. Um, Palm Sunday is one of only 12 events in the New Testament that are recorded in all four Gospels. Um, and each gospel comes to the story from a slightly different angle. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is to read 
it for you out of the Gospels, but I'm going to piece it together with different parts of the Gospels um, so that we get a little bit of a sense of the, the overall thing. Um, so, let's see. All right, and you can follow along with me as I read there. But, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of God! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, for the last, I don't know, seven or eight months, we've been studying the books of First and Second Samuel in a series that we call The King is Coming. And we saw how the nation of Israel rejected God as, as their authority. And they wanted a king like all the other nations. And God allowed them to have a king. Saul clearly wasn't the man, although he was the first king. But he wasn't the man that, that God wanted for the nation. So God had David anointed as one who would take over the kingdom. And even though, even though David was the man after God's own heart, he was far from perfect, as we've been reading. But nevertheless, God had promised David that his kingdom would be established forever. And when you look at David's life, it was a spiraling mess. And of course, we're left thinking, you know, how is this kingdom going to last forever? You know, left thinking, you know, David can't be the one to save Israel. Can't even save his own family. He certainly can't be the model for the one that God would use uh, and, and a model for somebody who is God's man. But like we've said so many times, God is faithful to his word. And since he promised David that his kingdom would be established forever, that is what he was going to do. So he promised that a holy and righteous king would come. And so the Jewish people had an expectation that the Messiah was about to come here in this first century as we're reading in the New Testament. They expected him to be an earthly ruler though, a ruler like King David. They expected him to be somebody who was going to wage war against the Romans and, and restore their national identity, something that hadn't really been true of them for the last 600 years or so. 
Many people did not believe Jesus with what Spurgeon called a spiritual faith. But he still hoped, but those people still hoped that he would save them in a political sense, that he would deliver them in a political way. I mean, after all, look at all the miracles he did. If God could heal the sick and give sight to the blind and, and raise Lazarus from the dead, then surely God could use this person as someone who could overthrow the Romans and give them their freedom, just like he did in giving the Hebrews their freedom from Egypt and slavery. And it's clear that some who were shouting Hosanna weren't just doing it as a part of the procession, that some were doing it because they wanted to install Jesus as their king. They were taking this as a, a psalm that really applied to him. But they weren't thinking of Jesus in the way that we know Jesus. They were thinking of Jesus purely in that political earthly sense. And Jesus, in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he was demonstrating that he was the king. And the things that we read were kingly things. He was riding through the streets the way that he did. He was claiming to be king. And for most of the New Testament, up until this point, that claim had been somewhat hidden in the background. But here he is making an open claim before everyone that he should be acknowledged as king. Now there are several things that in, in, in this story uh, that Jesus did that, that pointed to him as such. The palm branches, they represented God's goodness and victory. And it was symbolic of the final victory as we look back on it, of, that he would soon fulfill over sin and death. Now the Bible says, oh death, where is your victory? Where, oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those palm branches represented the victory of a king. The donkey, as we read just a minute ago, was a fulfillment of prophecy. Your king is coming on a donkey. And certainly, you know, we think a king should be riding on a big white horse or something, but a king that was coming in peace was coming in on a donkey. Not as a, a conqueror, but as a, as a peaceful king. And that was King Jesus there. And the shouts of Hosanna... Hosanna, meaning save us, were truly meant for him. He said, but those who were shouting it either were looking back at the Passover or they were looking and thinking that they applied to Jesus, but in the political save us from these Romans kind of way. So it's not just to praise God for what he did some 1,500 years prior, but before what they wanted him to do in their current situation. But Jesus didn't come as the political king. And so let's let's just look quickly at, at what kind of king Jesus was. And the first one in your notes is that he certainly was the promised king. You know, as we he said in, um, in reference to the, the Samuel passage, that, that God had promised that he would establish a kingdom from the line of David. Second Samuel 7, that, that's the, the Davidic covenant, that I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Psalms, chapter 89 says, 
You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. And of course, even at the announcement of the birth of Jesus, um, as the angel is talking to Mary, he says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Like, Jesus came to fulfill the prophecy of what God had said to David a thousand years before. That he was going to be the one who would sit on the throne of David forever. That he was going to be the one that God promised them. And of course, those who heard this, those who knew the Old Testament saw that and they looked at Jesus and Jesus fit that, right? Like, that's not going against anything. Like, that's pretty consistent. Like, yeah, he's going to sit on the throne of David. What kind of king was David? David wasn't necessarily a spiritual king, right? So we, as we've been reading it, he wanted to do, right? And obviously he wrote a lot of Psalms. He, his heart was turned toward God. But at some point... David's heart wasn't turned toward God. But David was still that physical king who sat on a throne, who led politically and spiritually. And so Jesus could fit that as far as they knew. Like, if I'm honest, if I, were, if I would have been living in Israel at that time and I saw Jesus coming and I saw the things that he did, I probably would have thought the same things that most of the people did. That here comes a man, certainly blessed by God, who can do amazing things. He's going to free us from this. He's going to be that king that God promised. And yet, they missed all the other prophecies and all the other things said about the Messiah in the Old Testament that it was more than just a physical kingdom, but it was coming in a spiritual way. So Jesus was the promised king, just not in the way that most of the people viewed it or expected it to be. And the second kind of king that Jesus was is that he was a righteous king. You know, unlike Saul, or unlike David, who had their warts and all, Jesus came as the perfect king, the one who would fully do the will of the Father. On the next slide there, it says, you know, quoting Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and the right, uh, just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Well, certainly Jesus could do that. And certainly a physical earthly king could fit that. He can do what is right by the people and by the land. But Jesus' righteousness was different. His was a perfect righteousness. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like, Jesus wasn't just a good king. He just wasn't a, a, a physical king who would do right in the right situations. But Jesus came as a perfect, righteous king and fully did the will of the Father. And his righteousness was so that he could live that perfect life and die the sacrificial death so that we could obtain his righteousness as well. The third kind of king that Jesus was in coming was that he was a humble king. 
Now we already read from the Gospels that Jesus came in riding on a donkey. He came in lowly and humble. He came in peace. But his humility wasn't just in how he presented himself to the people. It wasn't just how he came, even as we can look back and say that he was the the suffering servant that is talked about in Isaiah 53. But his humility is marked even more so by the fact that he was God in the flesh. As Paul talks about in Philippians, that he, he emptied himself, that, that we should have this mind among ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. That Jesus' humility, again, wasn't just in how he carried himself, but how God, the creator of the universe, the almighty, the all-powerful, the all-knowing one, would come as a human, in the form of a man, He humbled himself to become a a sniffling little baby. He came and he set aside all the rights and privileges that he had as God, which is weird to talk about godliness as as a privilege, so it's not the same way. I don't mean it that way. But, But he set aside all that was true of him as the God of the universe, so that he can come and relate to us on our level. You know, I think one of the greatest things is to see a, a teacher who has all this kind of education and everything else to be able to, to come down to the level of a six-year-old and talk to them and interact with them in a way that both helps them understand but values them for who they are, even though they're just so young. I mean, that's a silly example, but that, that's somewhat what God has done with us. You know, we are the young, ignorant little six-year-old that God comes and interacts with us at our level. That's the kind of humility that our God has. That... Jesus as king had. The fourth kind is that he is the savior king. You you can read a bunch of different verses about Jesus being our savior. Luke chapter 2, as the angels announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, As for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. First, who knew what the shepherds thought? They they might have thought that he was going to be the Savior. That would be political as well. But Jesus came to save us from our sins. It's pointed out in Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's not saying that you're going to be saved from whatever political situation you're going to be in. You could be in chains. You could be locked up. But he is still your savior and you are free in him. You know, 1 John 4, 14 says, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior in the world, of the world. It was John looking back to all that he saw and experienced with, with Jesus could testify that he wasn't coming just to save Israel from their political situation. But Jesus came as king to live and die so that the world could be saved because of his 
sacrifice and payment for our sins. This is our king. He is our savior as well. You know, and it's different, you know, I, I, I hate the political climate of our country, but, you know, some people will look to one party or another. They're going to be the one to save us from whatever situation we're in. None of them ever do that. There's no political leader that could ever save us from anything earthly, much less save us from our broken spiritual condition. But we have a king who is a savior who will heal us and save us from that spiritual condition and then gives us a hope for a future. And that's the, the last thing, the fifth thing, that he is our eternal king. Several of the verses that we already read talked about him being on the throne, being established in the line of David as an eternal kingdom. But that is said over and over throughout Scripture as well. That Jesus is establishing an eternal throne. That it's not just one that's going to last for four years and then move on to to the next. But his kingdom will last forever. Jesus, who was God, so this, even though it's Psalm, is written here before Jesus even entered the the earth, but your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. It's the hallelujah chorus. And of course, in this eternal kingdom, we have this hope to be with him forever and ever. Peter says, and you will receive a rich welcome into the internal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That while his kingdom and his throne is established forever, that we will get to be with him throughout eternity with him. What a glorious thing. And how much better that is than any earthly king, any political leader. What a glorious king we serve. So if all this is true, then how do we respond to this? And like I said, if I were living in that first century, my response probably would have been a lot like the the people who are looking for a political king. I would have been so focused on my momentary situation and the political surroundings that I would have missed all the things that that the Old Testament had said about Jesus being that spiritual king, Jesus being the savior of our hearts and of our sin. My guess is that probably many of us would have too. But we have this privilege of living on this side of the cross. We have the privilege of being able to look back and see all that Jesus did and living his righteous life and dying on the cross, rising from the dead. And hopefully... My prayer is that all of us, we have given ourselves to him, that we have come to our Jesus as our king and we have given ourselves to him as we sang, I surrender all. But I purposely didn't put anything on our notes as a suggestion for us to, because even now, even those of us who have given ourselves to Christ still need to decide how will we respond to him. You know, our response wasn't a One time he saved us and we're done. 
I mean, how do we respond to a king? I mean, a king is somebody who is to be obeyed fully. A king is somebody who says, go, and we go. A king is somebody who says, don't, and we don't question, we don't. Or if he says do, we don't question, we do. You know, we're those in this story of Palm Sunday. We didn't read all of the different responses. You know, but there were those in the story. Some were probably just in it for the ride. They were, they were on that pilgrimage. They were familiar with those psalms. They joined in and they sang them. They didn't know what they were singing toward or who they were singing about. And like many of us in our churches all throughout this country, we say the words, we sing songs, we like the ceremony or the fellowship, but we fail to acknowledge for who Jesus was, who he is. Or some... Like when Jesus went into that temple as he entered Jerusalem, you know, he walked in, he looked around, and he left. He was ignored. People didn't notice him. Some people couldn't care less. And of course, some people just flat out rejected him. I mean, clearly... He's being hailed as king on one day, and just a few days later, he's being crucified because he didn't meet their expectations. They didn't see him for who he was. Now, Jesus not meeting our expectations, I think, is a dangerous one because I think sooner or later that happens with all of us, whether we're in the church or not, whether we've grown up believing that Jesus was Lord or not, at some point, we think following Jesus, we, we know how that's going to turn out, right? We know what to expect. We know what sort of king we want Jesus to be. And at some point, things just won't turn out the way that we expect them. He doesn't give us what we want tragedy strikes, doubt creeps in, we're disillusioned, and we're tempted, did we get sucked into the wrong procession? Are we doing the right thing? And our response to this king that we've come to know gets jaded. We have opportunities each and every day to look to Jesus as our king and decide how we're going to respond to him. Will we surrender all? Will we give all to our king? And so as we go into this holy week, as we go towards Easter, we know how the story turns out. We get to rejoice that even though he was crucified on Friday, that that Sunday is coming. So let's look at Jesus and respond to him and give him the worth that he is due. And let's give our hearts fully to him. Lord Jesus, you are our king. And whether we acknowledge it or not, it is true. And so God, I pray that each person in this room has has given their heart to you. That they have trusted you. Not just as somebody who can make their life better. That's not even necessarily promised for this life. 
Uh, may we have given our heart to you so that you can cleanse us of our sin and so that we can have a hope for eternity. And as our King, God, may we submit our lives to you to live for you, to walk in obedience, to walk in faith. For that is truly the response that you want from us. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.